Next, we'll set up Supabase. In this course, we'll focus on using the Supabase CLI to create a local environment that will run the same Supabase instances that are created when you make a new project on Supabase.com, but they're all running in Docker right there on your machine. There are some limitations to this approach at the moment. This course will navigate around those limitations and I'll make updates to the course as more of these limitations are removed. I have been in contact with the CLI team at Supabase and I'm optimistic that these limitations will be resolved soon and I'll post updates to the course as these become available. To install the Supabase CLI, we'll run the command yarn add dash capital D Supabase. This will add Supabase as a dev dependency to our package.json file. There is a temporary limitation that requires us to run the command yarn add Supabase again in order to correctly install the Supabase binary. I've been in contact with the CLI team and they've assured me that this will be resolved soon, but it won't hurt to run again if it has already been fixed. We can run the command npx supabase dash dash help to confirm that the CLI is properly installed. The help option can also be applied to all the CLI commands if you want to explore the CLI tools further, and I've left a link to the CLI docs in the notes below. Next, make sure Docker is running on your machine and run the command npx supabase init, and then the command npx supabase start. This will initialize and then start up and arrange all the supabase images in Docker. We'll store the API URL and the anonymous key from the terminal inside of a new file called .env with a name that starts with vite. This is required by vite for the variables to be accessible inside of our web app, and we'll see how to use them in a future lesson. Next, we'll create our prod instance of Supabase on app.supabase.com and gather our prod API URL and our prod anonymous key and store them in a new .env.production file. This way, when we run a production build, we'll set the app to connect to the production instance while still connecting to our local instance while we're developing. Next, we can go to localhost on port 54323 to open our local dashboard. This is very similar, but not exactly the same as the app supabase.com dashboard will go into the authentication tab and turn off the requirement to confirm email addresses locally as this will make our lives a bit easier for making accounts. This will retain that setting until we stop Supabase via the CLI. So to make sure the setting is still set on our next Supabase start, we can adjust the Supabase slash config.toml file. Note that we can further adjust other local configurations here as well as needed. Note though that we'll leave this feature on in our production instance as email confirmation is generally a good thing to have in your real sign-off flow. Last up, we'll create our first migration file using the command npx supabase migration new starting dash ddl. This will create a migration.sql file with a timestamp attached. We call this file starting dash ddl because ddl stands for data definition language, which is a term used to describe SQL code that is used to create the structure of a database, but not to insert, read, edit, or delete data in that database. There are two purposes to this migration file. First, when we run Supabase stop to shut down our local instance, and then Supabase start. CLI will run all the SQL in these migration scripts in order of their timestamps. Note too that after all migration files are ran, the seed.sql file will be ran as well, which can be helpful for seeding data if you wanted. The second purpose of these migration files is the Supabase CLI allows us to push our migrations to a linked production instance. We'll do this when it's time to deploy our application, but if you're curious how this works, the production instance will keep track of any migration scripts it's ran before, so it'll only run new scripts when we push our migrations up.